Well, good morning and welcome to Sunnyside, where we are a people following Jesus to those not yet. My name is Corey and I'm one of the pastors here. It is a privilege for me to be able to bring this message to you today. I am super excited about the series that we're going to do here, but I'm also super excited about the weather that we've been having recently. So uh, break out the shorts. It is summertime. Hopefully you got to join that this weekend. Uh, also, hopefully you're able to participate in this particular online service with someone else, either in your house or you're at somebody else's house, because uh, that's what we're encouraging people to do is to, is to do this online, but to do it with someone or in a group so that you can en enhance your experience. Uh, with that being said, uh, several years back, uh, I received this book from a friend of mine, and, and the book is called 50 Reasons Jesus Came to Die by John Piper. That, that, this dude's brilliant. He's incredible if you've read any of his stuff or listened to some stuff. But, um, but, I, but I love this book, and I love it so much that it's actually inspired this series that we are going to be going through over the summer. And i got to tell you, um, I've not been as excited about a summer series uh, as I am about this particular one because I think it's going to breed some, some really, really good things. Now, uh, this particular book goes about it a different way than what we're going to approach it, um, but I'd highly recommend you grab this. Um, if, if you are looking for a good read uh, from a devotional standpoint, it would be a great resource for you. Uh, but this is kind of the basic concept. While many of us are familiar with the gospel, uh, just so you guys know, uh, gospel literally means good news. Translated in English, it's, it's good news about Jesus. So even though most of us are familiar with the good news about Jesus, uh, we have a very limited understanding of exactly what the cross accomplished. And that's what this series is about. It's, it's, this, it's a series called Cross Examined, What the Cross Accomplished. Now, many people have heard the gospel but, but most people actually only understand it from a certain point of view. Scripture, however, uses multiple words and concepts and, and even illustrations to help demonstrate what the good news actually is and what it's done. You see, God, he's, he's an incredible God who helps us to be able to understand things. And oftentimes what he does is he gives us these earthly illustrations to help us understand heavenly concepts. He, he does this with relationships to help us understand how he wants us to relate to him. And so he relates to us as a father does to a son or as a groom does to a bride or as a king does to a, a subject so that we would better understand what kind of relationship that he desires to have with us. In, in the same way, or at least in a very similar way, God also gives us various ways to understand what the cross actually accomplished. Now, this is not going to be an apologetic series in, in the terms of cross-examined. It's actually a gospel series where our hope is that you walk out of this summer series better understanding what the cross has actually done for you. And by making you more aware of these, what we're calling gospel expressions, you will be better equipped to help those not yet to take hold of this good news right where they happen to be, wherever they happen to be. And here's the deal, guys. I, I just believe this from the core of my being. The more confident and equipped that we are, the more likely we are to share the things that we, we will talk about. I mean, this happens in everyday life. Whatever it is that you know well, whatever it is that you've researched, you're, you're able to talk about it a little bit further. And so the goal, the goal of this series is to give you a fuller understanding of what the cross accomplished so that you can better communicate that good news to those who have yet to receive it. So hopefully this is going to firm up what you already believe. And for some of you guys that have never actually received the good news of Jesus or never heard it in this way, man, this is going to be a great opportunity for you to be able to hear it in a way that you can actually take hold of it yourself. Now, as um, I was doing a, a message last week at the kayak, you all might remember that. Um, we had kind of a, a little bit of a hiccup. Uh, we, we started off on the shore and uh, we, we got everything set, all the cameras set. We had a GoPro on the, on the kayak and uh, we did the first shot from the shore and then uh, I get pushed off into the water and I'm starting to move. And then all of a sudden, uh, the GoPro just takes a dive into the water. And I'm like, oh no. Well, thankfully, I just had tied it off. It was in a waterproof case. So we're all good. But now I'm on the water already. And so I get the GoPro back out of the water and attach it. It's, it's now firmed up and I kind of reposition it. And I'm like, okay, wide angle lens, we're, we're good to go. And so then we proceed to go ahead and, and do the whole message. And we do all these different shots and make our way down to the other end. And at the end of that, I'm like, man, this is good. I'm all good. I felt really good about that. And so we ended up hanging out with uh, our kids for a little while, fishing, kayaking. Um, we're, we're getting ready to kind of close things up and, and, and load up the kayaks. And uh, Jason says, let me check the GoPro footage real quick. And I'm like, all right. And so he checks it and he comes back and he says, uh, so 
I got some good news and I got some bad news. You've been there, right? You've, you've had scenarios and situations like this. And so I'm thinking, oh man, what, what, what's happened? And so I said, Jason, give it to me. And he goes, well, the good news uh, is that the, the quality of the, of the GoPro is great. That's, that's awesome. So I'm thinking, okay, that's good. What's the bad news? The bad news is that we only got from here down on the kayak when you repositioned it, because it was my fault, it wasn't his fault, when you repositioned it on the kayak. And I'm thinking, like the whole thing, like, like all of it? And he's like, yes, all of it. <laughs> so obviously that's not what I wanted to hear. But, but think about that for a moment. If, uh, if I had only stopped to hear the good news part of what Jason had to say, I would have stopped at the fact that it was a good quality shot from the from the GoPro and that's all I would have heard and what would have ended up happening is you would have had a headless pastor uh, preach the message As a matter of fact here's here's some evidence of what that would have looked like all right <laughs> however uh, I didn't stop just to hear the good news I also heard the bad news it was actually necessary for me to hear the bad news that it and that it cut off my head because by knowing that I now knew what I needed to do I, I knew I knew what the response was at least I had the opportunity to, to make the right decision. You see, I believe that that's the case for us when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to this issue of the gospel and what we're going to be talking about. See, as Americans, we oftentimes start off with a, a view of God through the lens of Jesus. We actually begin with the good news. We begin with grace. And, and, I, and I love that, but the problem is, is that we're skipping a step because I believe you can't fully be grateful for grace until we realize how much you need it. Guys, you don't deserve it. We desire it. We need grace. And so even though I want to get to the cross and I want to help you to understand what is accomplished in, in all these different ways, we're going to do that through the series, I can't fully help you understand the good news of the cross without first helping you to comprehend the bad news. Because in reality, without the bad news, there really is no good news. <laughs> so let's take a look at some bad news. Now there's a guy named John Stott, and he wrote a book called Basic Christianity. Uh, also just a foundational uh, book for me. If you've never read that and you're looking for something that's just solid, I'd highly recommend this particular book. And uh, he says that when it comes to the gospel, you first have to start off with who God is. That's like, that's point number one. Everything else hinges and facilitates from that point. So who God is. Now, guys, I understand that this is, this is a huge topic. And honestly, uh, people have varying views of God. Uh, you might be sitting there wrestling with your understanding of God, and you're not even sure if there is a God. And if there is one, I'm not sure uh, like what he's like. So for this illustration, we're going to make an assumption, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to populate the God column over here with the ways in which he's described through the Bible. And again, I get this. Some of you guys might not be um, uh, believers in the Bible. You might not hold it as your truth source, and I get that. So for this illustration, we're just going to be using what the descriptions of the Bible actually say. Now, if, if you wrestle with any of these descriptions, if you wrestle with the existence of God, and there are people who are watching this, maybe alongside of you, myself included, would love the opportunity just to talk with you or chat with you more about these things, okay? Uh, but let's, let's move on. So who is God? Who God is? These are kind of the characteristics of God, his, his innate qualities, the things that are always true about him. And what the scripture tells us about him, we're not going to describe these comprehensively, but I'm going to give you three main ones here. It says that he's a loving father. It describes him as, as a God who didn't just put things into motion, didn't just create things, but he actually has entered into it in a way that he has shown and demonstrated that he actually cares about you and he cares about his creation. And so he's, he's loving, uh, but he's also a just judge. That's another thing that you can, it's like inescapable. And again, as Americans, sometimes we have a hard time with this view of God, but, but he is a just judge. He does what is right and what is good. And so uh, that's the, the next thing is that he is a good God. And that word for good is, is not just like, um, like good or great. It, it's like, it actually means perfection, uh, holy, uh, without blemish. All right. He, he is the very essence of everything that is good. And so this is just a, a quick list over here. So this is a quick list of who God is. So now let's turn our attention to who we are. Now, first and foremost, are you always loving? Are you always just? Are you always good? 
The answer is no, right? None of us are always these things that God is. And therefore, you and I are not God. <laughs> now, I know you know this, um, but sometimes this is a realization we have to come to. Um, there is a God and you're not he. And so with that being said, um, we oftentimes do things contrary to the very nature of God. Not only are we not God, but we do things actually in opposition to who he is and how he's actually set things up. And when we do this, uh, that's, what, that's what's called sin. Sin is anything not of God or anything contrary to the nature of God. Now, this term may be a familiar term to you. You've probably heard it a lot, but oftentimes I find that people have an incomplete understanding of what sin actually is. And, and the better we understand what sin is, we can understand the other aspects of it. And so let's, let's dive into that for a moment. So let's take a look at this column over here that's going to represent us, and we're going to talk about this issue of sin. And so the first thing I would ask you is, have you ever told a lie? If you answered yes, then you're with the, you know, the majority of all the rest of us because we've all told a lie. If you said no, you, you just lied now, and so now join the rest of the crew, right? Um, the fact is we lie. And, and I think most of you would agree lying is bad, right? Yeah, it's not good. Um, we don't teach our kids to lie. We actually teach them that that, that is bad. But, but let me ask a question that you might not have thought before. Just because you accept it, generally, that lying is bad. We shouldn't do it. We'd even use that word sin, lying is sin. But why? Why is it sin? Why is, why is lying not good? Why is it not something to be celebrated within our culture? Why is it not something that we actually instruct our kids how to do and, and to praise them when they do it? Guys, catch this. And this is really important for us to understand what sin is. Okay, Lying is not bad because of its effects. Lying is not bad uh, because of, of what, it, uh, what it actually happens to or the, or the benefits. Like I can actually be, I can benefit myself by lying to others, at least for a, for a time. But that doesn't make it good. Lying is bad. It is inherently sin because of its relationship to God. God is truth. Jesus says, I am the truth, the way and the life. And because God is truth, when we tell a lie, we're doing something contrary to the very nature of God. You following me here? Now... Um, there, there are actually two sides of sin as well, because not only is it a, a sin, uh, not only is it lying when we proactively tell a lie to somebody else. In other words, there's a line here, and, and it's like this is this is not lying, and this is lying, right? When we when we step across the line, that's called trespassing or transgression. That's the word that's used um, in scriptures. It, it means there's a line being drawn, and we've crossed over. We proactively told a lie, but there's actually another line, and it's a line that we're supposed to measure up to. And, and this line is that we should always tell the truth. And so oftentimes we know something that's true. Maybe somebody believes that we did something nice and it wasn't actually us that did it, but we don't correct them. And therefore we withheld the, the truth. Okay. And that's called, a, uh, that's called the sin of shortcoming or, or omission, the sin of omission. So there's this line on the bottom, right? That's, that is a line that we should always measure up to because we always should tell the truth. But there's also a line on the top side that says that we shouldn't cross that line. We shouldn't proactively tell a line. In the middle here is truth. That is what we're aiming for because that is who God is. And the reality is we miss the mark on both sides of that. that that's actually the imagery that we get from the word sin. Sin is actually uh, an archery term. Uh, you may or may not know that. Uh, the, the word sin is, is, is actually an archery term for missing the mark. And so you, you, got, you got this board and you're trying to hit it and you get points for being able to hit it. Obviously, you're aiming for the bullseye. But, but if you hit off of the board, you miss the mark. It's called sin. No points. Disqualified. You're out. Okay, that's kind of the, the, the concept behind this. That's what sin is. Let me give you a few other illustrations just to make sure that we're honing in on this. Okay, on this side of this, um, have you ever stolen anything? Yes, you probably have. Even if it was small, okay, we steal. Is it wrong? Absolutely, it's wrong. But what if I steal from, from people who have a lot and I give it to people who, who don't have anything? Or, or, or what if my family was starving and I stole food? Uh, maybe you would do that, but is it right? Is it good? The answer is absolutely not. Do we teach our kids to steal? No. Is it accepted in, in our culture? No. Why not? Okay, here's the deal. Stealing is bad, not because of its benefits, not because of its consequences, but because of its relationship to God. See, God is provision. He is the giver of all good gifts. So when we proactively take something from someone else, 
what we're doing is we're doing something contrary to the nature of God. We, we have crossed over a line and we have trespassed, we have transgressed, that's sin. Okay? But in the same respect, if we have it in our ability to be able to do good for other people and we don't do that, then we're not being like God. We didn't measure up to the line that he, he gave to us. We've fallen short of that line. James actually gives us an imagery into that. Moving on, let's take a look at murder. Murder is bad, right? If anybody in your house just said it's not, it's like you probably need to do something about them, right? It is bad to take a life. We know this. It is sin. Why? Not because the government says so. Not because there is a consequence to this. Because God himself is life. God is the giver of life. He is the source of life. He is the very essence of life. Because God is life, when we proactively take a life, we are actually doing something contrary to the very nature of God, and therefore it's sin. But guess what? It's not only when you proactively take a life, it's also when you don't do everything you can to value the sanctity of human life that we don't measure up because God has given that life to somebody else and it is precious to him. And so when you are biased, when you are prejudiced, when you are racist, when you are apathetic, you are actually doing something contrary to the nature of God. And it breaks, it breaks the character and the heart of God when you hate someone or you're apathetic to their plight. Jesus actually says this, you've heard it said, do not murder. But I say to you, if you have hatred in your heart toward your brother, you're guilty of committing murder. You might have thought you were free and clear of this on this side, but the reality is the way that Jesus defines it, we don't measure up. We lie, we steal, we murder, and there's a whole other list of things over here. Now, in regards to this, this hating your brother thing, guys, uh, this is an issue that is rampant right now within our culture. And I just want you to know that this is something that we are going to address as a church next, next Sunday uh, as we talk about the, the concept of reconciliation and being reconciled to God and to others. We're going to be hitting on this, so make sure you tune in there. But we're not going to talk about that just yet. Now, bad news, part one. We have sin on us. Now, I say part one because there's actually more to it. But bad news, part one, we have sin on us. Scriptures tell us we have all sinned and fallen short of the standard of God. Yeah, we know it when we've crossed over, but we've also fallen short of the standard of God. And every single one of us has sin on us. Now, defining sin is, is part of the understanding of the bad news. But, but now we must actually turn our attention to what sin actually does. So that's bad news part two. Sin separates us from God. Now, when we do things that are not of God, we are actually pushing ourselves away from Him. We are actually creating a separation from Him. Many people have this picture of, of God in, in heaven as this big meanie that has, has put together all these rules and all these regulations, and he's just, he's just waiting for you to break one of those rules so that He can send you to hell or send you away from Him. But that's not the picture that we get of God at all. On the contrary, God has actually revealed himself to us. He has shown himself to us. He has declared, this is who I am and this is how I designed things so that you have a very clear understanding of what I actually expect. When you stop to think about it, guys, the Ten Commandments are, are less a, a, a list of rules and regulations as much as they are a, a, a reflection and a reality of who God is. It, it actually shows us, and when you read through these, how, like, who God is and how he's actually created things. But, but then he declares this, guys, if you cannot be like me, and he's made it very clear who he is and how he's created things, then you cannot be with me. There is a separation, there is a divide because of your sin. You know, the, the Apostle John spent a lot of time with Jesus and uh, he's one of the uh, last of the apostles um, to, to actually die and he died a natural death as we understand. Um, but later in his life he was given a revelation and, and it was a revelation specifically about what heaven would look like. And he says this in Revelation 21, 27. He says, nothing impure will ever enter it. And when he's speaking of it, he's speaking of heaven. Nothing pure, impure will ever enter into heaven. And why is that the case? And let's think about this rationally, okay? Uh, when you think of heaven, is it perfect? Yeah, it, it is. As a matter of fact, <laughs> you may not even be a believer in God right now, but most of us have a concept of heaven, and that concept of heaven is that it is perfect. It is, it is pure. There's no more pain, no more tears, no more hurt. That's in the same chapter that we see as this way. Like, heaven is a good place. It is completely perfect, except if you are there. 
<laughs> now you might be going, what? What are you talking about? You see, if, if God let you in as you are with your sin, with your inadequacies, with, with, with your tendency to do bad things, right? To things that are not like God. If he let you in as you are, you would actually taint. You would taint heaven and you would make it not perfect, right? Be, be, because you, you, your presence would actually be an insult to heaven. Now, I don't mean that to be uh, harsh to you. That is a reality that we actually uh, experience. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. Um, uh, imagine with me here, I've got a, I've got a purified bottle of, of water in my right hand and I've got this, this vial of highly concentrated poison uh, in my left hand. Um, which one of these can you drink? Well, well, you can drink both, right? But, uh, but if, you, if you drink the poison, what's going to happen? You're going you're gonna to die, right? If I drink the water, I, I will live. Matter of fact, I need this water in order to live. That's how we're made. Now, if I took a, a small drop of this highly concentrated poison and I put it into this purified water, now which one can I drink? The answer is, is neither. Well, why not? The condition of this one has actually changed. It's no longer purified water. It is poison. Even just with a small drop of this, it is poison. It has the same effect. Whether you have a lot of it or you have a little of it, it will kill you. You cannot drink it anymore. That's how it is with us and sin. Even the smallest amount of sin on us disqualifies us from being with the perfect, holy God. That's how it is with us and heaven. You see, an imperfect person like myself allowed into the presence of God with sin on me would actually be like poison to this water. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about that or not. But even the smallest amount disqualifies us. Now catch this, guys. When I ask you this question, what is heaven? There's probably some imagery that comes to mind to, to, to you, whether it's stuff that you've read or stuff that you've seen. But in its simplest form, it's not as much of a place as it is a presence. Heaven, in its simplest sense, is being with God. It's, it's actually being in the presence of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being in His full presence. That's what heaven is. Catch this, guys. When we sin, we separate ourselves from His presence. That is heaven, right? And if He is the source of life, which we've already described and we unplug ourselves from the source of life, the, the inevitable result is what? It's death, right? That's the inevitable result. When we unplug ourselves from the source of life, death is our reality. And the, this death is a spiritual reality that we often don't experience yet because it's not presented itself physically. But make no bones about it. Our spiritual death because of sin also results in a physical death. And whether you know it or not, we're all perishing. Death is an inevitable reality for all mankind. There is a 100% mortality rate among us. Like we're all going to die. What we may not know is that we're also dying in our sins and because of our sins. And, and get this, guys. If we die physically still in our sins, separated from God, then the destination is Eternal death, eternal separation, which is hell. Now, if heaven is simply eternally being with God, then hell is simply the eternal separation from him. Now, this might be hard to hear, guys, but this is the bad news. We have sin on us and sin separates us from God. Our reality is because of our sin, we are already separated from Him. And therefore, hell is already our destination. If you don't believe me, let me take you to the words of Jesus in John chapter 3. Now, most of us go directly to John chapter 3, 16, and we love that because that's the good news. But right, remember, we have to focus on the, the bad news in order to be able to understand what the good news is all about. And so Jesus, as John reports these words, speaks it this way in verse 18 and verse 36. He says this, whoever believes in him is not condemned. We're going to get to that in a, in a minute. That is the good news, right? The bad news, whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of, of God's one and only Son. And then he says it again in verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Good news, we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life for God's wrath 
remains on them. It's not something that comes to you in the final judgment. It's already our reality. It is our existence, our destination apart from Jesus because we separated ourselves is hell. Bad news number two. We've sinned. We've got sin on us. Sin stands between us and God. And bad news part three, there's absolutely nothing you can do about sin on your own. There's absolutely nothing you can do about sin on your own. You have to ask yourself, okay, if, if I'm separated from God um, and I want to be with him, what can I do in order to get with him? And we might conjure up some ideas like, well, uh, what if I do enough good to outweigh the bad? That's a very popular thought in our society, in our culture. There are, there are other uh, religions or philosophies that kind of build themselves around this. Um, if I do enough good, it'll outweigh the bad. That doesn't even work in the physical realm. <laughs> Why would it work in the, in the, in the spiritual realm? If, if I forgot my wife's birthday, but then I did the dishes for her, like that doesn't pan out, right? Like the, it, it's not a one for one kind of thing. The good doesn't outweigh the bad. The bad still exists. It doesn't get rid of the sin. Yet somehow we think in our mind, I'll just do that. Many of you guys have been living your lives like that. You've had a rough past. You've done some things in, in your past that you're not proud of. And, and so you're dedicating yourself to do good things, to be able to absolve yourself from the bad things, but you can't. And it'll never be good enough. And you know it and you feel it, but you're going to keep just wearing yourself out because you don't understand the good news of grace, which we'll get to in a minute. But they don't cancel out, okay? So that falls short. But because it doesn't take care of sin and, 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 and it's a matter of actually my perfection. I need to be perfect in order to be with God, but I never can be. So, so some people will start thinking, well, what, what if from this moment, like now that I know this, what if from this, this moment I can be perfect from this point forward? All right. Well, that's a pipe dream. All right. That's, it's not possible. Uh, I got news for you. I've been a, a, a follower of Jesus since I've been six years old. I've been a pastor for 17 plus years now. Um, I sin almost every day in, in multiple ways. I, I'm, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. You can't be. But even, even if it were a possibility from this point forward to be perfect, you still have sin on you from your past. And you guys need to understand this. It's your sin that separates you from God. That's what separates us. Satan doesn't separate you from God. It, he's a proactive adversary. He wants to keep you away from God. But it's actually your sin that separates you from God, and you have to do something about that. So some of you guys are thinking, well, what, what, if, I, what if I go to church every week and, and, and I pray to God every day and I read my Bible as often as I possibly can? Guys, those are good things, and you should do those things, but none of those things deal with your sin. No, no matter what kind of knowledge that you have, it doesn't actually deal with your sin, and that's the thing that separates you from God. Guys, you have sin on you. Sin separates you from a perfect God. You are actually dying in your sin and there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. Bad news part one, part two, and part three. All right then. Well, I've done my job. Good luck with that. <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding. I'm not going to leave you hanging there. Once, we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But, but when God, our Savior, revealed His kindness and love, He saved us. He saved us because of his mercy, not because of the righteous things that we have done. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through his Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, we were made right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life, life with him, presence with him. Guys, it's not until you fully understand the bad news that you can fully appreciate the good news, the gospel. Watch this. My name is Tony, and I was one of those not yet.
Well, I'm a pastor's kid, uh, so I was raised in the church. I went to church school, church camps, church everything. My dad was a choir director and a music minister. So um, I spent Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesdays, Thursdays, sometimes Saturdays. I was in the choir and you know, we were a traveling musical family as well. So I went to other churches and, and spread the gospel through music um, from the age of five till uh, we, I was probably 13 when we finally stopped that. Um, so I was, I was raised up in the church. My family was a very God-fearing, um, legalism-bound family. Gosh, high school, um, you know, you get involved with the wrong crowds and do all the fun stuff you're not supposed to do. And, and of course, you know, I had people in my life that were from my church telling me, you're not supposed to be doing these things. You know, God wouldn't be happy with that. And, and I took that a different way. Um, as a teenager, being stubborn, I thought what I was doing was fun and that's what I wanted to do was have fun. So, um, you know, if you couldn't accept me the way I was, I just wasn't going to be a part of it. So that's, uh, Pretty much at about 16, I'd, I stepped away from the church, uh, kicking and screaming with my parents the whole way, and, and uh, I ended up moving away from home, and, and I just had to get as far away from, from that life as possible. Like I said, you know, if he couldn't accept me the way I was, he wasn't going to get me at all. Well, I, uh, I moved to Oregon um, with a backpack that had a pound of weed in it, and. Uh, uh, some other fun items that a 16 year old shouldn't have traveling across the country. And so I, I get to Oregon and I immediately start selling drugs. So that was the, uh, uh, the, the starting of my, my career. And I call it a career because it was 20 years long um, as a drug dealer, which, um, you know, as, as in that life, it leads you down some bad paths. I was in with the wrong crowds and gangs and bikers and, you know, every uh, shady individual you can find. Um, I, I started with weed, I got into meth, I got into acid, I got into a lot of other other drugs and, and just, you know, I, my job was to peddle them, so that's what I did. Uh, a lot of them I didn't do, but I did get into methamphetamines that I did do for a lot of years, um, and they almost took my life on a couple of occasions. Um, well, at 19, I overdosed, <clears throat> which is when I quit doing methamphetamines. I didn't quit selling them, I just quit doing them. If I didn't quit doing something here, it was going to kill me. Um, I was either going to die or end up in prison, one of the two. And then uh, I finally came to a point at, at, at 30, I guess I was probably 32, and uh, I decided this, this isn't the life I, I want to live anymore. I want to settle down. I want to have a family, and this just isn't congruent with that. And so um, I stopped doing drugs. I stopped selling them. Um, and it was at that point where a change started to happen. I wasn't exactly going to church. I wasn't back into religion or anything of that, but there was a change happening. God was working in my life um, in little areas. And um, I look back now, like if I'm 43 now, so I look back, you know, at the 12 years ago, and I think about these, just these little, little things that changed that opened my eyes to maybe being perceptive to something more than me, you know? Um, but in, until then, I was I was just I was in it, man. It was it was uh, there was only two ways out of the life that I was living at that point in time, for sure. Man, it was through a neighbor, and and she would talk to Jamie constantly. Hey, we should come check out my church. We should go to this Bible study. You should come to this conference. You should come to this concert. You should. Jamie always had a reason, no. You know, and that was me. Um, I was always like, I won't darken the door of a church as long as I live. Um, that's kind of where I was at. And uh, she kept, she kept on. She didn't give up. Um, God was speaking to her and telling her that that we needed Him, and we did. Um, we were about ten weeks from being married. I finally asked Jamie to to marry me, and we were about ten weeks out from that. And uh, my wife asked me one day, driving down the road, and I remember right where we were at, we were crossing some railroad tracks in Gilbert. She looked at me, she said, I think we should go to church Sunday. And I said, okay, which was not something I normally would have said. Um, so uh, there we were, we were going to church Sunday. And um, the sermon that was being preached that particular Sunday was on God's whisper. And hearing him, like taking the time to actually, I'm thinking to myself, does he really even talk to people? I mean, that's absurd, you know? Uh, especially the life I was living. I wasn't trying to believe he was even real, let alone could talk to you. Um, but he was definitely talking to me and he was talking to my wife and he was moving in us. And uh, 
And I left there just rattled. Everything that, that the preacher said, and I believe that, that that sermon was being preached by Paul Carpenter, if I remember correctly. I remember him standing up on stage and, and he said, I want you all just to, to be still and be quiet. The whole room was a hush and there was probably 2,000 people in this auditorium and I'm sitting in the second row and I'm freaked out because I've never been that close to a stage, you know, except for when my daddy was up there when I was a little, little, little guy and, and, uh, and it was like he was talking to me. There wasn't even nobody else there. It was like, you know, we were having a, a conversation where I wasn't saying anything, but he was laying out sections of my life right there in front of me and in front of all these people. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm leaving there, how does this guy know me? How does he, how does he know? How does he, how could he know? He, everything he was laying out was the guy that I am, you know? And uh, that rattled me. And so I had to go back. Um, um, but the following Sunday, they talked about cohabilitation. And me and my me and my wife were living together, and we weren't married yet. And um, somewhere deep down inside, that that was one of the ones I think that got me, like to really start thinking about salvation and faith, and and what does this mean? And I'm about to get married, and I wanted really bad that, uh, my marriage to be blessed. I didn't want to start off, and and I still wasn't at this point yet sure if I even believed all of this, but. If there is a God, and, and if, if there was somebody out there watching over us, I really wanted his blessing on what I was about to embark on, because I didn't want to do this again. This was a one-time shot for me. Um, so I moved out. I went home and moved out of the bedroom. I stayed on the couch for the remainder of our time together before we got married. And that'll freak your soon-to-be wife out when you aren't you know, living by faith. You, you don't think about those things, but I was really moved. Um, the next, the very next sermon Cal preached, and it was about surrender, and that 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 was the one that gave these bracelets away. That said that said surrender, um, and I, I, they just put a cross at the front of the church and said, "Look, you know we've all got our baggage, and this is where I found out that God could love me, in spite of all this crap that I had done, and in spite of the horrible life that I lived, and all the people that I had hurt, and all the destruction and damage that I had caused, that He could still love me, and I, I'd never heard that before." and all the years that I had been in services and in church and growing up, and I'd never heard it portrayed that way before. I would always heard you had to toe the line and you got to be the best you that you could possibly be and as close to perfect as possible or you'll never make it. And those are the things that I was hearing, whether that's what's actually being said or not in my adolescent mind, that's what I heard. Um, but now I'm hearing from a pastor that I didn't even know uh, but that's not the case. That that's not the God that we serve is a God who loves us regardless of all that crap. And uh, they told us to write down on a piece of paper, um, I would have had to have a novel because I didn't have enough paper to fill with the things that I needed to surrender that day. But I wrote down the three big ones in my life at that point in time. And, and, um, and I surrendered those that day. And, uh, I put that bracelet on to remind myself, and I wore it for many years after that, probably, probably three or four years after that, I wore that bracelet. And anytime my, my brain would start headed down that wrong road again, I'd snap that thing like, really hard. And it would remind me about the day that I surrendered and who, whose I was now, and that I no longer belonged to the world, that I now belong to Christ, and, and that He was now alive in me and working through me. So that's how I came back. Um, 2015 I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer and given three months to live. Um, at that point uh, we were at a loss, we didn't know what to do. Uh, through lots of prayer, um, the elders praying over us, my wife was a warrior, prayer warrior, so she prayed for me every day. Um, skip ahead a couple of months. We were sitting in the doctor's office after this particular doctor had prayed over me as well. And they're about to do a biopsy to tell me how long I got to live exactly and give a date and number to the cancer that's in my throat. And as he did his uh, preliminary checks to figure out where he was taking his biopsy from, he um, looks up from them and, and tells me that I'd been healed, that the cancer was no longer in my throat. And, he was seeing no signs of any scar tissue damage of, of any kind. And that uh, at that moment, he told me that I needed to go home and be with my family and praise God because he had healed me. He chose to save my life. And 
And he didn't say it, but I, I knew that I, I, was no long, I, was, I was in no way, shape, or form deserving of that. I deserved the death that I, I had been previously diagnosed with, and uh, I had been given a second chance. And that was probably the turning point in, in my salvation. My name is Tony, and I once was dying, but I am now alive because Jesus saved me. I once was dying, but because of the cross, I'm now alive. Jesus saved me. Guys, that's the message. That's the good news. That's what you just got to hear in, in Tony's testimony. And, and I, I know, I know you, 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 you probably on the front side of this message were like, Corey, it, it was stop with the bad news already. Can you get to the good news? But guys, you, you cannot fully appreciate what the cross has accomplished until we understand our degradation, until you understand the bad news that we have sin on us, that it separates us from God, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing we can do on our own. But God loves you so much that he came to you he laid his own life down on the cross to save you. No matter what you've done. No matter what you have accomplished, no matter what your past happens to be. You are at the same level as myself, as Tony, as Jason, as Jill, as anybody who's sitting in your room. All of us are in need of a savior. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Apart from Christ, I was dying. But because of the cross, I am now alive because Jesus saved me. Jesus himself says this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives by believing in me will not die. And he asked this question, I think each and every one of us has to wrestle with. And it's this, do you believe this. Do you believe this? Whether or not you've realized it before, I'm laying it out to you. This is our reality. What you see before you hear this visual, this, this earthly illustration, this stage set, if you will, it is a representation of the spiritual reality that exists for us. Apart from Christ, we are dying. But Christ stands in the gap through the cross. And that is the good news for all of us. But for each and every one of us, it requires a response. Jesus is asking you the same question that he asked that group of people that day. Do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the life? Do you believe that I, I span the gap between death and life? Each and every one of us must deal with the words and the work of Jesus. He is life. Even though we have been separated from him, he has bridged the chasm between us and God, life and death. But you have to respond. God moved first, but he's given us an opportunity to move in his direction, to acknowledge your need for a savior. So I want to take it to John 3, 16, the good news verse. <laughs> that we are all familiar with. But instead of, instead of using the, the world, which is what, the, what it implies, yes, Jesus died for the, the, for the world. He also made this personal to you. And so today what I want you to do, wherever you're at, wherever you're watching this, whoever you're watching this with, I want you to say these words out loud and I want you to insert the blank with your name. I want you to do that with me. For God so loved Corey that he gave his one and only son that if Corey believes in him, then he shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn Corey, but to save Corey through him. Jesus saved me. Jesus saved you. And if you've not yet received it, you need to understand that Jesus wants to save 
you. And so today, I don't know where you're at, but if you need to step on the bridge of Jesus, you need to step into his salvation, you need to declare him as your Lord and your Savior today, I want you to do that right now, wherever you happen to be. Just get down on your knees and declare that there is a God, that you're not him, and that you need a Savior like Jesus to bridge the gap between you and him. And if you've made that decision in your heart, man, we would love to be able to hear about it in person. So respond in the chat section. Uh, email me, call me, talk to somebody that you know who already believes who Jesus is and have a conversation with them. Move from death to life today because Jesus makes it possible through the cross because he saved us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for simple illustrations, for earthly metaphors that help us to understand spiritual realities. And I look forward to this series because, Father, it's going to help us to be able to grasp the concept of grace all the greater. And because of that, our gratitude is going to well up because we understand that no matter where we stand, what we've done, what we've accomplished or, or the things in our past, that none of that stuff is what actually gets us to you. It's only your cross. It's only because you've chosen to save us because you've moved in our direction that we have a shot. So, Father, I just pray that each and every one of us would strengthen our grip on your salvation a little further today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't forget, guys, we are a people following Jesus to those not yet.